Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Welcome to Vlog 276, Preparing for Your PhD Program. And this vlog also has a nickname to it, Getting Your Ducks in a Row. This vlog comes by request from Adeline. Hello, Adeline. And Adeline made the really great analytical point that the overwhelming majority of these vlogs focuses on already existing PhD students. So you're already in the program and how do we render you successful or indeed more successful? But Adeline wanted me to start to think about helping the students who are preparing to enter a PhD and that is a great request and she confirmed and you always hold me to accountability which you should and Adeline made the comment that I use the phrase getting your ducks in a row quite a lot you know you need to get your ducks in a row and that's great but what do I actually mean by that phrase and that's a great question and critique and I'll try and manage that critique today what do I mean by getting your ducks into a row before you enter a PhD program so this is useful for that group but can I also make another key point here for a lot of people out there hi you are currently suspended from your studies you are intermitting you've stepped away from the program for a time and hoping to return perhaps you've done a PhD in the past you withdrew from that program and you're about to have another go so for that very precious group out there this vlog, I hope, offers you an opportunity or a chance to take a breath, have a think what went right, what went wrong in the past, and perhaps go through this process once more to get your ducks in a row to go again. Now, as always, I'm going to list 10 ideas for your consideration. And the material that I read to prepare for this week was quite unusual. There are thousands and I mean thousands of blogs pieces of journalism published in and out of academia that use the title something like what I wish I knew at the start of the PhD that I know now so what I wish I knew at the start those sort of titles and there are thousands of them so I read a stack of that material I also read institutional guides, so what universities around the world are saying these are the skills that you require to enter and be successful in a PhD program. And also I used a series of refereed articles, particularly from Library and Information Management, Library and Information Science, to enable particular parts of this vlog that you will see. But I'd also like to dedicate this vlog to Jared, Hi, Jared. Jared wrote one of the most beautiful emails, messages to me I've ever seen in my life. Jared, this vlog is for you, as well as the wonderful Adeline, and I know you're going to be successful, and this vlog might just provide spaces for us to talk about in the next few months, preparing you for what I know will be a successful PhD. So are you ready? Let's go. Let's get our ducks in a row. Let's start to get you ready to enter a PhD program, or indeed, ready to go again with propulsion, with meaning, with success. Let's do this. Number one, crucial, build relationships. Preparing for a PhD, most importantly, requires that you build professional and personal relationships. So at Flinders University we have a supervisory charter. So for our friends around the world watching this vlog, if you put into Google Flinders University and supervisory charter, you'll find a very special delicate document that provides a list of talking points, if you will, between students and supervisors advisors that talk about rights, and roles and responsibilities and that document we get all our students to print it out take it to the first meeting and talk through the matter of the professional relationship between academics and students so this is important because documents like that allow you as a student to express your assumptions of success your assumptions of what the PhD program will be like what it will be about and it will also allow your supervisor to express their perspective their views and come to a meaningful agreement and hopefully create a meaningful conversation 
Also, I would advise, look up the research seminars that are available in your faculty, in your college, in your school, and start to get a sense of who is doing the work in your organisation, right? Start to have a sense of who your lab mates will be. With a bit of luck, you might get an introduction and meet them early on. You might get a sense of who else is working with your supervisor. Ask to be informally introduced to them, even via email. So get yourself focused on the new space that you're about to enter and the new relationships that you're about to build. So this is important, particularly if you're entering a lab-based environment, start to get a sense of who is in the lab, how they all get on and how you will fit in that space and in that relationship. Very, very important. And also I am using relationship broadly here. It has multiple meanings. Obviously, the relationship with your supervisor, advisor is absolutely crucial. Obviously, your relationship with your lab mates, your cohorts, your peers, incredibly important. But also, you need to sort out, you need to have the conversations with your partner, your friends, your kids, your parents. Get your family oriented into what is about to occur. So you've heard me say thousands of times that it takes a village to graduate a PhD student. Well, you know what? You need to spend time building up the systems and the structures to make that village operate and do that before you start. Two, think about your working environment. This is crucial. Now, your university may allocate a working environment to you. There may be a lab, there may be some rooms or some office space that is available to you. This is an incredibly important space. And can I say, there's no doubt that about once a week I have a student in the office complaining about the behaviour of another student in the office or in the lab. So this is something that is rarely talked about, but is a very, very big issue for students. So start to think through how you will work with other students in a shared space. So what is important is you sort yourself out. What's important for you in terms of communication, about privacy, about being quiet, what are your rules and guidelines about conversation or not, respecting the views of others in what often is a pretty tight space. So if you are in a group environment, start to think through your guidelines, your mantras about communication and engagement. Now how will you construct borders and boundaries to make all these relationships around you operate effectively in the long term. Also, if you do have the opportunity to create a home office, even if the home office is your kitchen table, start to think about how that space will be organised. Um, now, as you know, for me, my home office is everything. My office at work, I see students, I do work-related material for my job as Dean of Graduate Research. My research happens at 2 a.m. in the morning. My research happens on weekends. So my home office, which you've seen upstairs, is very precious to me. It's very precious to me. And it's very simple. It has a desk, it has a chair, and it has books. It has nothing else in it but that it is geared to enact research, no other function. And as you can see, it is organized for me to write and research. So think about your best working environment and know that you have to organize it. A working environment doesn't just happen man. A working environment has to be constructed. You have to actively configure it and work out the best system for you to manage distractions crucial. Now, I recorded a vlog earlier, I think, with the title, Organise Your Life to Write. I know a lot of people have liked that one. Thank you so much for that great feedback. But you do have to organise your life to write. You have to organise your life to do research, because if you don't, then life passes you by. Life is not geared to do research. It's geared to do all sorts of other things, but not research. So you've got to reorganise everything to make research happen. So use the time before you enrol to think about the spaces of your working life. Three, read early, read often, read now, yes, read. I judge students, hell, 
I judge people by what they read. It's my great tragedy, it's my great discrimination and prejudice for which I apologise, but I do judge people. I judge them by their reading. And what you need to do before you even enter the program is have a sense of the field that you are going to investigate. And you have a sense of that field, yes, by writing the proposal that we talked about last week, but also by reading through your field with scope and scale and intensity before you even enroll. So get books, get articles on methodology. So that's not changing too much. Methodology, the clock on methodology is much slower. So read about methodology. Look at the absolutely current refereed articles in your field. Look at the really, really edgy new stuff. So the other truth I have to tell you is we learn to read by reading. We learn to read by reading. We gain a vocabulary, we gain the shape of debates by reading fields. So get into the habit, before you even enrol, to read every single day. It's such a blessing, it's such a privilege to be able to read the words of others. If you think about it, reading is a gift that you give yourself every single day. So read. Read often, read today, read now, read. Four, write early, write often, write now, write, write. Very few things frighten me more in a doctoral program than when a student says to me, oh Tara, all I've got left to do is write this thing up. All I've got to do is write it up. Now, that's the equivalent of saying, Tara, all I've got to do is tomorrow morning I've got to get up and I've got to walk to the moon. Get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to walk to the moon. Are you? That's the equivalent of saying, yeah, all I've got to do with this research now, this PhD, almost done, mate, almost done. Just got to write the thing up. Right. Good luck with that because you need to write early, write often, write now, write. Before you enrol, Get into the habit of writing, writing every single day. Now look, at the early stages, you don't really know what you're writing about. So you might want to write about your motivations. You might want to write about what you think a PhD is, what you're hoping to get out of the PhD. That's all great. No time is wasted if you're thinking about motivations. Motivations are everything. If you're writing through the motivations, that's a good use of time. And the dream probably is to move from the personal stuff to writing about what you're reading with interpretation. So start to move beyond paraphrasing. Start to move beyond the summary and start to create interpretations. Now, you may decide to write a blog through the PhD and tens of thousands of students around the world do do that. And as the research has shown, particularly from the Scandinavian countries, that the students that do blog every day, you know what, they do better. They do better because they're reflecting on the journey of doing a PhD and therefore they're more successful. Now, can I be honest with you, I'm not a great journaler. I'm also not a great blogger. I've never really done that stuff. It's a bit sort of hippie for me, right? It's like, let me tell you how I'm feeling, right? Well, okay, but if you can do that, that's great. Not my vibe. But where I really like doing writing is in response to the reading. So as you're starting to develop your interpretation and the shape of your scholarly world, you write those meanings, you write those systems and structures. So start to write with meaning and write an interpretation. Incredibly valuable work to do. These are incredibly important skills. Five, obviously we're leading to information literacy and academic literacy. Reading and writing are skills. They are skills. You are not born <laughs> able to read and write. We learn to read by reading and we learn to write by writing. But if you spend the time early on learning about academic literacy and information literacy, it will save you thousands of hours and indeed may save your PhD. But you know, we talk about information literacy and academic literacy so rarely. And Linhart described information literacy as, quote, neglected essential learning quote, neglected 
essential learning. That's how important information literacy is, right? So I recommend that every single student out there, hi, every single one of you, look to your university library, look to your librarians and look at the courses that librarians put on for you. Librarians and their courses, their in incredible expertise will save you weeks, months or indeed years of your candidature. Learn about databases, learn about the interfaces that are available, learn about the software that's available to enable your research. And most importantly, you know what? Wow, spend some time in Google Scholar. Google Scholar, for well over a decade now, has saved me thousands of hours in research. It allows me with precision and speed to find the best research in the world. And it is remarkable to me that still to this day, students underutilize Google Scholar. So I have students coming in every day into my office saying, Tara, there's no research in my field. Seriously, this happens every day. Tara, there's just nothing there. I, you know, I'm, my original contribution to knowledge is so clear because no one's writing in my field. So I get them to sit down, we open up my computer, and I go into Google Scholar and I ask them, tell me the two or three big names in your field and tell me the two or three terms, right? That's all I want from them. I put them into Google Scholar and I find often 15,000 refereed articles produced this year alone. So make sure you know how to use Google Scholar and it comes from a strong vocabulary but also knowing the key writers in your field and that will be your engine through Google Scholar and Google Scholar will be the engine for your research. Therefore, use your librarians, let them teach you about the best databases and learn how to use Google Scholar. I also want to do a shout out to two of my greatest friends on planet Earth, Dr. Jane Secker and soon to be Dr. Naslin Bimani. Now, these are two of the greatest scholar librarians on planet Earth. They write, they research, they've won a series of awards, the pair of them, they are amazing international awards, and they've both committed very deeply to open access. And both, of course, are very heavily interested in doctoral education. So if you want just some initial first steps to think about a PhD and information literacy, then put into Google Dr. Jane Secker and Naslin Bimani. Put their names into Google and they will be your most important guides to information literacy in doctoral education. Six, start with the end and in mind, think about examination. Start with the end in mind, think about examination. Now a PhD is really unusual. It's a very odd piece of assessment because what's happening is you do all this work for all these years and only one object is being assessed. And it's being assessed by people that you do not know. So no wonder the whole thing is a little bit stressful, eh? Yeah. So what I would advise, and this will change your life, is before you enroll in a PhD, read an already completed and successful PhD. So find your discipline, go into Google Scholar, and find a PhD sit down with that PhD and read it. Learn about the genre. Learn about what a PhD is, what a PhD looks like. But also, go to your university, in our case, Flinders University, and look up the PhD examination policy and procedures. Every university has one. So right at the start, before you even enrol, look at the policy and see how your PhD will be examined. So make sure you understand what, what is being examined and what examiners are being asked to do, how they are going to assess your research. And look also, then talk to people. Talk to people like me, talk to deans around the world. We do hundreds, at least, hundreds of examinations every year. We read thousands of reports. Ask our wonderful professional colleagues, our staff in the North American system, who manage our examination. Ask them about the process. Get the information you need. So 
you need to understand the ending right at the beginning. Seven, develop your expertise in teaching and learning. Now, there's no doubt that casual teaching budgets in universities are declining. So there are fewer of the old fashioned tutoring or lab demonstration roles available. There is no money. So there are fewer of these roles available for you. But it is important that you learn how to teach and that you learn about learning for when an opportunity does arise. Because the chances are these days, it'll come at very, very short notice. Okay, so while you are preparing to enter a doctoral program, look at the opportunities to complete some teaching programs. Start to learn about teaching and learning in universities. So how to write and manage a lecture, how to run a seminar, how to run a lab, how to create effective online learning <laughs> post COVID. Not a bad idea. So there's plenty of these short courses on LinkedIn. There's plenty of these short courses on academia.edu. And of course, there are magnificent, magnificent MOOCs available that teach you about university teaching and learning. So come into the program with some sort of short course on learning and teaching, just sitting in your back pocket. So when an opportunity emerges for you in teaching and learning, you can grab it. Eight, work out what you hope to achieve through the PhD. Motivation is everything in a PhD. Without motivation, you will not finish. So write down, writing, write down the answer to the question, what am I hoping to achieve through this PhD? Answering this question requires that you understand the gaps, your skill gaps in your current life, but also you understand the intellectual, the emotional, the social challenges that you may face. What are the skills that you don't have? And what are the skills that you would like to achieve? Nine, time to open that CV. Oh yeah, so open your CV. And if you don't have a CV, time to create one right now. Because in a doctoral program, uh, CV is a living, breathing document that you touch at least once a week. So what I need you to do is create new headings, work out what flesh will be hanging off those headings. So if you want to get started, if you want to just put in some headings like your publications, it may be articles, it might be book chapters, it might be books, it might be conference proceedings, it may be video abstracts, it may be podcasts, it may be seminars that you conduct, right? It could be consultancy, it could be professional development, it could be community engagement and consultancy. So just list these headings down. Now don't worry, most of those headings will have nothing under them and that's cool because this is a living, breathing document. You're starting here, but you've got targets, you've got headings that you're aiming towards to fill up that section. So give yourself space in the CV to have attention to teaching, what you're teaching, community engagement and consultancy, and obviously research. And yes, 10, do the reflection work. Think about how you give and how you receive feedback. Think about deeply what frightens you, what worries you, what frightens you. Be honest. Do this really tough work early on. Think about what gives you confidence. Think about what saps your confidence. So get yourself personally and professionally prepared and organized to enter a PhD program. Now, one great way to scaffold this type of knowledge is to read about the experiences of other PhD students. And if you put PhD blogs into Google, 23 million returns exist for you. 23 million PhD blogs. So immerse yourself in the experience of others, not to replicate them, not to get frightened, not to get lost 
in the lives of others, but use those experiences to create reflection for you. So the key realization for me, if there's just one take home bit of advice from this vlog today, it is a realization that a PhD is not a continuation of an undergraduate degree. It's not a continuation of honors. It's not a continuation of a master's degree. A PhD is different. And when you're preparing for the PhD, I need you to think honestly about those differences, how it's a different type of qualification and how you need to behave differently within that qualification. This is a different way of knowing, a different way of being and a different way of learning. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.